Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Father John Markey. He is a Dominican priest. He is associate professor and director of the Ph.D. Program of Spirituality at the Oblate School of Theology in San Antonio, Texas. He has been assistant professor of theology at Barry University, Miami Shores, Florida, assistant professor of systematic theology and philosophy at St. Mary's Seminary, and University in Baltimore, Maryland. Visiting professor, Seattle University School for Theology and Ministry in Seattle, Washington, and assistant novice director, Dominican Common Novitiate in Denver, Colorado. BA, Masters, University of Notre Dame, Master of Divinity, Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology at Berkeley, and PhD, Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. That's a lot of merit badges, Father Markey, with the greatest respect. So wonderful to have you on the show, speaking to us via phone from San Antonio. You're going to be coming to Albuquerque through the Dominican Ecclesial Institute to give a wonderful presentation and also talk about your book, Moses in Pharaoh's House, subtitled A Liberation Spirituality for North America. Welcome, Father Mark. Well, thank you. That was... <laughs> That was quite an introduction. I really appreciate that. Tell me a little bit first about yourself. If you can give us a little insight into your path to the Dominican order. Well, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas, and um, kind of a normal childhood, not anything extraordinary, but um, went off to Notre Dame, uh, University of Notre Dame, which for us was the great urban north. You know, it was um, quite an excitement to grow up and got interested there. Uh, actually, the funny thing about it is some people always wanted to be a priest. You know, I always wanted to be a professor. I don't know where that came from. Except for the fact, you know, like I was, remember one time mowing a lawn in 95 degree weather or 95 percent humidity in Senate here at home and and thinking to myself, I need to find a job, a career that doesn't ever involve work or labor. And I think that's where I came up as a kid with the notion of being a professor. That was the one thing I thought could keep me from ever having to do any, any work. So um, I went off. And I was really interested in philosophy. I was kind of interested in a lot of things, and that was one of the great things about Notre Dame is I was able to kind of do all kinds of stuff. Philosophy and theology became really my kind of passion and, and history, and uh, I stayed at Notre Dame to get a doctorate in medieval thought. And um, about halfway through that doctorate, I realized I was really less interested in thinking about the Middle Ages than living in them, and that I really wanted to study contemporary philosophy and theology. So I left. I only knew one Dominican uh, in my life, but I, what I was really in love with was the name of the order, the Order of Preachers. I just thought it was such a great name. And uh, to be honest, that, that it's kind of a weird reason to choose a religious order, but that drew me more than anything else. And I, uh, so I eventually did join the order and... Uh, went back, and they immediately sent me back into a very contemporary setting to study philosophy and theology and and gave me the opportunity simultaneously. I mean, one of the great things about the Dominicans is you kind of end up doing ten things at once, and which for me it has always been a real blessing that, it, you know, I'm not limited to just academic life or just pastoral life, but, you know, I'm able to combine them, and it's been a real joy that a big part of my life has been not just teaching, although I teach and write and all that kind of thing, but also that I work a lot as uh, in spirituality as actually teaching and working with Dominican spirituality and Dominican groups and the part of the Dominican family, but also that my main sideline interest that I've been able to do for 20-some years now is preach, literally, and uh, work in parishes and work in dioceses with lay faith formation and just basically preaching and working with people on uh, on a real practical level on faith. So, you know, it's really been the best of both worlds for me. And so, and that's what my charism is as, as a Dominican and everybody's all along is encouraged it. Nobody's really ever thought that was a bad idea or that I should just focus on my writing or my teaching, that everybody's always understood the real need to be working in both ways simultaneously. So it's been a really great um, direction or path for me. You know, it really is my 
ties in with my own personality and my charisms and gifts. So I'm back in San Antonio for the first time in almost 30 years, and I came back, got an opportunity six years ago to come back and teach, and I hadn't been around my family in a while, and that's been the most remarkable thing, to just be able to go to baseball games and uh, soccer and take my turn with the carpool and, uh, (laughs) you know, just to be around and to see a whole other side of life that really, to be honest, it always been kind of outside, and I see people with kids, but I never actually had to be responsible for any of them. And, and of course, the best thing of all is I have a, a whole new set of images and stories and things, reflections for my preaching. So, I mean, it's just been a gold mine of of great insights about life and these kids. I mean, you know, you could take a day with any one of my nieces and nephews and make an entire half a year of homilies out of it. I mean, you know, they're just remarkable. And so that's where I am now and kind of really basking in that, that it's been really a joy to be part of a family in that way again in the more intimate ways of just the daily life of the kids and my brothers and sisters and mom. So From your innermost personality through the expression of the Dominican order, You truly are an itinerant preacher, which brings us to this wonderful event coming up, July 26th. Father John Markey will be here in Albuquerque. I have as the title or the theme of your talk, Gifts for the Church. Is that correct, or should it have been Gifts of the Church? Actually, this is the funny thing about it. When I was invited, it was Gifts of the Church, and, um, (laughs) you know, (laughs) this is... I really am the absent-minded professor. I mean, that really should be. I really fit this. Whatever anybody at home thinks about, you know, kind of impractical life of academics, I'm the stereotype of it. So I think when I agreed to the talk, we had another talk in mind. That was maybe the talk (laughs) that I was invited to give. But I'm really more interested in giving this one about gifts for the church, because I think one of the interesting things Francis has been trying to point out, Pope Francis, is that in some ways the church is a gift to us. It's a gift to the world. It's a gift to people individually in their lives and their own quest for sanctity and and for uh, spiritual growth. But on the other hand, the reason we do that, the reason we participate in the life of the church and join in the life of grace and grow in sanctity is not for ourselves. It is not so we just can be happy or that we can feel fulfilled or that we can find God or something. We're doing that so that God, in a way, can find us and use us to serve the world, that it's not a self-centered or narcissistic church, that it's actually about fundamentally about sending people out, that the whole thing, the whole church is in mission to people and to service of people in their ordinary lives and the real circumstances of their life. And so I think that in some ways, I, I, I tend to do both in my talks around the country, which is I think there is a group of people, and, and rightly so, that feel, maybe, maybe rightly so, I don't want to judge either, but you know, they feel like they don't understand why the church is important, how it fits into their lives, et cetera. And so I do a lot of times try to explain to them, to, especially when I teach undergrads and these groups, why it might be that the church is really in some ways different than they think, first of all, and what its purpose is might be more essential to their lives than they realize. And they, because the culture doesn't quite articulate or, or, or make sense out of why you should belong to any social union or any deeply committed community of people. I mean, most peoples have very limited, you know, they're they belong to lots of groups, and they do a lot of stuff, but they don't feel deeply, fundamentally committed to some organization or some community. So I spend a lot of time just explaining why the church. Why the church? How does it fit into the Christian message? How does it fit into the gospel? How is it really a gift Jesus Christ gives to us for our sanctification? So that is a talk I give, but I also feel like that if so I'm, I'm always trying to weigh whether to preach and talk about that, or sometimes it's it's more important that we move forward and talk about how the church now, in this time and place, is meant to be a gift to the world, you know, a gift to 
um, people who aren't in the church, people who aren't who feel actually alienated or disconnected or unwelcome in the church, or people who feel that way in the society. And so, I think, kind of, uh, I, 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 you know, my first book was about creating communion. One of my first books was about creating communion and about the church itself and and the kind of uh, trying to explain to people in some ways the value and the importance of the church for their daily lives. So I, that's why the, it's funny that you picked up on the exact issue, you know, like which of these do you kind of talk about? But I think in conversation with the Institute leaders, they really wanted me to move forward and talk about how the church, because, and I think that's what Francis, Pope Francis, and your own, you know, this wonderful new bishop you just got who um, is really Francis-focused, a Francis bishop, and, and I think uh, – that it's important that the church can only make itself relevant or people can understand why it's important to their lives if they see it active, serving, and out there. You know, in other words, to just explain to them the value of the church isn't really the answer. You know, we preach with our lives first, and then we explain it afterwards. So it's really important for me, I think, that those people in the church that are committed and active understand the importance of the church to the society that we're living in. In this uh, DEI presentation on July 26th, if you only spoke about what you've just mentioned, this would be uh, wonderful. But as it happens up your sleeve, you have a fireball that (laughs) you're throwing out your most recent book, Moses in Pharaoh's House. The more I read the reviews and descriptions, the more exciting Wonderfully agitating, volatile, but deep. The content seems the subtitle, Liberation Spirituality for North America. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, Something written about the book, John Markey argues that North Americans are enslaved by a false sense that self-centered idealism is morally good and necessary for achieving the common good. Moses and Pharaoh's House, A Liberation Spirituality for North America, explores how those living inside the oppressive structures of the first world can be freed from false ideologies to achieve personal and socio-political conversion. This review also suggests the book presents a spirituality of conversion for the privileged, that's we in the first world, develops a connection between the liberation of the oppressed and conversion of the privileged, Tell us about well, that's this a great, book. That's a great review. I wish I'd written it myself. <laughs> you, you don't... I love when people say more articulately uh, what I'm trying to say than I do. So <laughs> that's great. You know, Mary, the best way for me to get at this a little bit is to tell something of the story of my own life. You know, one of the things that happened to me when I started studying theology, you know, everybody, the, the rage in the 80s and stuff and the, when I first started was liberation theology and you know, it was really fascinating because it was it was coming out of cultures that and places that, you know, because I was a Dominican, because I was in this international religious community, I was able to visit some of these places, you know, uh, the the these poor regions of Peru and 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 um uh Argentina and Central and South America during the the wars uh, that were going on, the civil wars. Uh, you know, parts of Africa and stuff, where you could see that liberation wasn't like an abstract concept. It was literally that these people were living under profound political and economic social oppression, and that that by liberation, it was first of all liberation from death. That the one of the keys is poverty and the kind of political oppression, and then you know, in the late. In the early 90s, we were doing a lot of work with people from Eastern Europe and coming from these highly polit- – you know, where, yeah, they might have had food on their table, but th- that they were, they were socially and culturally deadened by the oppressive culture, uh, the oppressiveness of these governments. And so, you know, it was easy to see how liberation had a real practical and direct – effect you know you were trying to free people from systems that were deadly that caused death i mean you know uh people were literally starving to death and dying of diseases that 
you know, don't even exist any longer in Europe and the United States and a lot of places in the first world. And so one of the things that you saw was how liberation was a critical dimension of what the what was going on. It was also something that Vatican II, this isn't something that these people made up. It wasn't something coming out of Marxism or something. It was actually coming out of the council itself, that the, the fathers of the council were deeply concerned about the conditions of ordinary human beings in their lives, and especially that the church found itself on the what we call the pre, what they called the preferential option for the poor on on the side of those people who were struggling to deal with these death bringing and death structures, you know. But I come back then. You know, I'm living in Berkeley for God's sakes. I mean, it's like living in somebody's version of a dream. You know, you can drink great coffee and eat all these scones and you know and we're all talking about liberation theology but liberated from what i mean you know we're in the most politically liberal play you know we can vote for anything we we have every you know i might have only got thirty dollars a week or i didn't even get that much i think i got thirty dollars a month in those days. <laughs> but still i mean you know here i'm living in one of the most economically privileged um I, all the educational, all the health care, you know, everything. I was living in this world, and then we're talking about liberation, and it occurred to me, well, what, what do we need to be liberated from? I mean, if the gospel is about liberating people from the real things, that, the real aspects of their lives that are destroying and death-dealing, what is it for me? I mean, I don't live in economic or, you know, the poorest person I've ever met has higher standards of living than... Uh, in the United States and, and whole societies of people in other parts of the world. So, um, And as screwed up as our politics can seem while we're in the middle of it, I mean, it makes a lot of the politics around the world, it really is, you know, it's still our country. I mean, and we have lots of control over it, even if we don't exercise it well or whatever. But so that's when I started thinking, well, what does it mean for us to be liberated? Because the gospel is supposed to, is supposed to be a gospel of liberation for every time and every place and every culture. And that's what, again, Vatican II calls us to make the gospel relevant, to call people to change and liberation. That's where I realized that in the third world, and I, I, don't, I use these, these terms about first and third world very lightly. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to suggest that the, there's, a, you know, there's some diminishment or something, but in a world that where there's all this socioeconomic and political oppression and they're suffering, there's civil wars and all this, they need a, a kind of direct type of intervention. So liberation makes sense. For us, I think that in the first world, in a world that's politically, socially, and economically a success, it needs a different kind of liberation. It needs to be converted. I mean, the conversion itself is liberation in the New Testament. I mean... Jesus says, you know, the scribes and Pharisees keep coming up to him, and what is it we need for eternal life? And he says, love God with your whole heart, with your whole mind, and with your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, you know, that's pretty much at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. It's at the heart of what it means at the gospel. And we can see that it's at the heart of every spiritual, every single spirituality that, that emerges in the Christian tradition in the West is a, is a way, often for different types of people in different places, even different personality types, to, to, to practically love God with their heart, mind, and soul, and love their neighbor as themselves. And so, their selves. And so, but in, in the United States, it seems to me that what the rest of the world needs from us is not that we be more liberal, liberated, but that we be truly converted. Uh, then I use this, the, the book actually title that comes from Hebrews 11. And in Hebrews 11, there's this great line where he says, he's talking in Hebrews about faith and how faith saves people. And faith in this context is a faith in God who understands our destiny differently than we might or our culture might understand it. And so there's this line where he says, by faith, Moses knew that he was not Pharaoh's daughter's child. But indeed, by faith, he knew that his own destiny lie with the people of Israel. And so I've always thought that was, a, that was a profound notion of the other side of the Exodus story is that 
Moses, you know, he doesn't want to be in Pharaoh. You know, he just grows up in Pharaoh's house. He doesn't have any particular desire to be an oppressor or he isn't organizing, you know, uh, the, the empire or anything. He just is, a, you know, he kind of almost inadvertently lives in this world where he begins to become conscious of the fact that it's not fair, you know, and that people aren't treated correctly and that what God desires isn't working out and that his his faith is not so much what he does uh, in terms of response to God's call, but the mere fact that he saw his own kind of, and it took time, it didn't happen overnight, but that he began to see his own destiny with the oppressed, enslaved classes, rather than with the with the king and with the pharaoh and with the people who were naturally his his family and his neighbors and his friends, and that he started to see his own identity tied in to the identity of a people that he didn't know he was connected to at all. So I think that's in some ways what the challenge in the U.S. culture is, is is to go through that process of conversion precisely so that we can identify, you know, with a wider world that we don't really understand or connect with at this level. And that's why I think that Francis is calling us as a gift to the church to precisely engage in that level of conversion so that we can be available to serve the whole church and, and serve it in a way that might not immediately fit into anyone's particular socio-political or economic agenda. You know, in other words, it's something different because it's coming out of a transformation of our whole way of looking at the world because we're looking at it through Christ, taking on the mind of Christ and looking at it from God's point of view, which which isn't the way, you know, the Democratic or Republican Party or this group or that group looks at it. It's it's ultimately its own way of looking at the world, and it it challenges us in some ways to be different kinds of people than we are, even if we're good people. But does you know, that make sense, or it, did it, I? It does indeed make sense. I'm checking off some of my topics as you already hit them in stride. Liberation and conversion for me, because even you know, as I in talking to this great father of liberation theology, the goal of of sociopolitical and economic liberation is not just that people can have air conditioners and TVs and cell phones and, you know, vote. It's that they can be free because, you know, when you don't have any food, it's really hard to work on your personal sanctification, you know, and work on your prayer life and everything. You know, you're just trying to survive. But the goal of the of liberation is liberating people for Christ and for sanctification and for service to the whole church it's not just to give them a better life because ultimately you know this life but it's actually you know this life has its own limitations no matter how so liberation is about enabling people to be free enough to engage a genuine and holistic life of conversion liberation and conversion are in some ways sides of, of a single coin that um, go together, you know, and that that in the in our world and the in the kind of U.S. cultural context, to be converted, in my opinion, really fully and completely converted in Christ, would liberate us from a lot of the challenges and problems and brokenness and 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 hurt and 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 and, and negativity that that consume our first world. I'd like love for you to address two points. One is. Uh, what do we in America, what do we in the first world need to be liberated from? Because you also mentioned that. And before we started our recorded conversation, you mentioned that uh, there is a contemporary connection with a medieval heresy that it, you suggested that uh, we entertain in American life. Can you address those points? Right. You're, yeah, well... Okay. So now I don't claim to have the last word on all this, but I, you know, of course, that doesn't mean I don't write a book and say what I think. But what I think is there are kind of four walls, as it were, that are keeping us, four things that keep us kind of walled in in American life, four ways of thinking that are limited, or limited, or limitations, or even false ideologies that help us 
that keep us from really seeing the world the way God sees it. One is the kind of radical individualism that we spoke about, where, you know, I'm really only responsible for myself. I'm not necessarily connected to anyone other than my own and meeting my own needs. And, and the, the real, we see that the real effect of this ultimately is that, you know, kind of with something like, I'm not necessarily, I don't have any responsibility for people other than myself, including, you know, even sometimes my own family or even sometimes the child in my womb. You know, it's a, that's the radicalness of the individualism is where I feel like my needs and my taking care of myself really does come first. And, 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 and that other people, even in my society, or like I say, even close relationships to me, uh, aren't my concern or don't take or don't have the same level of importance as my own meeting my own personal happiness we've we've made or, uh, selfishness an art form oh yeah oh, oh my god it's amazing and you know the second thing i point out is that you know and this is a longer story but you know that the proto sin in the new in the scripture and and the proto sin for saint thomas aquinas is envy and, you know, where we see our own identity tied up in somebody else's identity, and we try so hard to be, you know, this covetousness, to be what the other person is, that we never really bother to understand what we're meant to be. And in the United States, NB, you know, you can get an, an MBA, you know, that that's what the whole point of marketing is. And, you know, it's we have a whole science devoted to developing and 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 you know, creating envy in people. Now, you know, I'm not going to say that's all evil or even horrible, but it is when we so much live in this world of consumer, and it becomes a kind of ideology of we are what we own, we are we are what we fundamentally, you know, we're identified by external realities that that other people recognize as important, uh, but it, they don't necessarily have anything to do with us. So the car I drive, the neighborhood I live in, the the clothes I wear, the the titles above my head. But you know, in the Catholic tradition, you know, we go before the reign of God, as Saint John of the Cross says, and we're asked, you know, the memory of who and how we loved is the only thing we take with us into the next life. And so, you know, that that so and so there's a that consumerism. The ideology of the marketplace of free market economics, not that you know there isn't a lot of value to capitalism I mean in some ways it's a very remarkable economic system, but there's a difference between having it as an economic system and having it a, a, a be the way you understand life it's not an ideology of life. or it's not an ideology with any depth right right no no and it, it's it's about it's one thing to have it be about economics it's another thing for it to explain social policy and educational policy and foreign affairs and everything else. It's like, well, then it's an ideology when it becomes about life itself. And so then I, I say the third thing is I think we're really a culture that is deeply superficial in a way that we're highly optimistic, but we're largely hopeless. I mean, in other words, it's a culture that's definitely afraid of death and uh, the that, you know, it's kind of the culture of get what you can now while you can. And that, you know, it's you, because you don't know what the future holds. And so that the idea that you would limit or sacrifice something good in this life for some future purpose is really a hard concept to get across to people. I mean, I teach undergrads, and, you know, even the idea, you know, that you would give up, you know, your – your sex life or your career or something so that you might serve other people because you know that in the fullness of time that you'll have all of it in a kind of back, you know, that there's a certain way in which it's, it's that that's really hard to explain to them because they don't grow up in a world where there's really any real future. I mean, everybody kind of believes in heaven. They're going to go there. But everybody, there's no way in which we're creating the conditions for it by what we do in our own lives. And so, I mean, this goes back to something Martin Luther King always said, is he was, he was deeply concerned about the fact that we're an optimistic nation, but not necessarily a hopeful nation. And hope is a different kind of, it has a different power than optimism. 
And so I, I and I get into that in the book. The third and the, la- the final thing is that I think we live in a nation that largely has a heretical view of God. And uh, you know, as I said, I just I was in the part of France for three weeks where the Dominicans began, and Dominic comes into this world that's profoundly influenced, and 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 the dominant theology is Catharism, which holds that there's a good God and an evil God, and that the world is really run and, and or at least dominated by evil, and that the secular, the ordinary natural world is evil, and that that there's really no way that we can be saved except through kind of belonging to some small, very uh, special group of people, and that almost everybody else is lost and damned, and that God is distant and judgmental and mean-spirited, and that, and I think that there's a lot of that in U.S. culture. I mean, you, I, I cite all these studies where, you know, we're one of the most religious cultures in the world. I mean, next to India, we're probably the most religious culture in the world. Ninety-six percent of people in America believe in God. Ninety-eight percent of people pray regularly. Forty-seven percent of people attend church services regularly. I mean, we're a profoundly religious culture in a way Europe and a lot of other places just aren't. But what God are we worshiping? It's not clear that it's the God of Jesus Christ. I mean, in these studies and surveys, you know, almost 70% of people say say that they believe in a God that's distant, angry, unconcerned with us, or mean, and basically mean, you know. And the God, the loving, accepting, merciful God of Jesus Christ, you know, gets 23% of people who that's their first response to when they think of God. And it's, well, I think that's a real challenge. It would explain in our society um, as people, you know, as people view their deity, um, they also emulate their deity. Oh, sure. So we have, oh, yeah. we mean, then I, have I a, a punitive. With, if you have a stingy God, you have a stingy society. If you have a God that wants revenge and wants to punish people, you don't give a second thought to spending infinitely more money on 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 um, on prisons than you do on education. I mean, you have no problem executing people, and you have no problem uh, dismissing people who don't work, don't eat, and this kind of thing. So, yeah, I mean, I think very much that the God we worship influences the way we act. I mean, and I think that's one of the great challenges that we're facing in the U.S. is not that a secularism like Europe where there are people who don't believe in God. I mean, people believe in God. I think they just aren't, I'm just not clear they believe in the right, they're not, you know, I think a lot of Americans in the the Middle Ages would have had a way, of, you know, in the Middle Ages, if, if you know, Dominic met these people, he just presumed they were all, all what we call Albigensians or Cathars, you know, the, the, and they make this fundamental distinction between this world and, you know, it's kind of like, well, what you do in this world doesn't really count because it's all kind of not real and, you know, you, you I read this to watch it on TV all the time, you know, this gospel of prosperity that that God rewards certain people because he loves them, and then all these other people, we shouldn't worry about them because, you know, they get what they deserve, you know, and that that's God's choice and there's nothing we can do about it. And in other words, I think there's a lot of popular religiosity in this country that that doesn't, that really diverges dramatically from the tradition of the church especially the Catholic tradition that sees grace happening in the fundamental way God communicates with us is through other people. And the fundamental way we communicate with God is through persons, other people. And, you know, that's, that's a radical view. I mean, God becomes a human person. He doesn't, when God wants to get into contact with us, he doesn't send us an idea or a book of rules. We're not a people of the book. We're people who have a book, but we're not like other religions. We're, we, we don't have a book. We have a person, a human person. And his life becomes a way of us thinking about our own lives and interpreting our own behavior. And imitating him becomes what we're really supposed to imitate and envy and desire is to be like him, which is a very different thing than the culture tends to teach us. So in that sense, I think, you know, I really 
you know, think that a lot of what the challenge we face is not um, to in the courts or even in the Congress or all this. I mean, it's back to what we were before. It's like what Francis says. We need to first persuade people and talk to them and preach to them about the God of Jesus Christ and the, the importance of that God and the reality of that God for our daily lives. And I think that it, that's missing. I don't think a lot of people, I think for a lot of people, it's going to be good news. Brings us, pardon me, I might be a heretic. Kids, don't try this at home. But uh, <laughs> that full circle journey that the church has made from Vatican II through many iterations of how to process that all the way to the most immediate, the um, encyclical Laudato Si, where Pope Francis, he presents the case that would have been the case Benedict was making against the heresies that he encountered. Um, Dominic, right, that Dominic uh, Sorry, Dominic. But Benedict oh. <laughs> is bound totally on board with this, so I don't want to... Uh, sorry, sorry, right. no, no, no disrespect to Benedict, but I met Dominic. This gift of life, gift of creation, gift of humanity to then respond to the gift, try our level best at every juncture to live a life worthy of the gifts that God has given us and to go beyond. You say it better than I do. No, it's, I mean, it's, this it's, full a, circle it's a remarkable experience. document precisely because in some ways, as somebody said, uh, you know, and I'm not, I'm not making this up, in many ways it's like every document in the church is really about the relationship of God's grace to our situation, how God is acting and is an attempt to explain a God who is acting in human history, that isn't ignoring it or merely watching it from afar or observing it or judging it, but is in fact actively engaged. And it's a God who created the world and and still participates. I mean, you know, like Thomas Merton said, you know, trees and flowers and cats all participate in the glory of God by being themselves. That there's a certain way in which the fundamental principle of Aquinas, you know, good tends to diffuse itself into degrees of participation, that the world in its own way, and in different ways, humans differently than rocks, but all of us have some participation in the life of God, because God chooses this. And it's not because of some, some kind of pantheon, you know, some kind of, you know, mystery of, of, you know, shamanistic religion. It's just the fact that God chooses to create a world in which God's own identity and God's own life is tied into it. And so God is acting through practical things like, you know, God, the, God does reach us through water and wine and bread and uh, oil and the fundamental things that make up the earth and our subsistence. But God's mainly interested in people and human people and their lives. And that, you know, to be concerned about what God's concerned about is to take our stewardship of the earth seriously, uh, you know. And I think one of the problems in the United States, it goes back to this hopelessness. I mean, most people think that there's something wrong with the climate. They're not literally denying that there's probably a crisis, but they feel so hopeless about it. They're just like, well, there's really nothing we can do. It takes such a dramatic change. You know, I don't want, really want to give up my SUV, so therefore there's nothing I can do. And there's a certain way in which that is a kind of that kind of helplessness is a hopelessness. I mean, in other words, I think that if you believe that God is working not just to create us, but to sustain us and redeem us, that somehow in God's plan there's a way forward. But we have to be open to see it, and the part of being open to see it isn't to be defensive you know, about my car or something. I mean, maybe maybe that maybe it is about giving up and changing our cars and our personal behavior, but it's probably even deeper than that. It's probably at an even deeper level of change. Then that's what frightens us even more, maybe, right? It's not giving up my car that's so difficult. It's maybe changing the whole way I look at my relationship to to material things. Isn't that a, a primary message we get from the Gospels, that horrifying, scary suggestion that we give up everything we have and in faith follow Jesus. Right. I mean, 
you know, as people point out to me, a lot of times I talk a lot about Scripture and, 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 and my addresses. And, you know, as I say, I think one of the challenges of the New Testament, why it's not, why, you know, a lot of people see it as good news, but there are some people who see it as bad news. They saw it as such bad news they felt like they had to kill the person who was delivering it. I mean, one of the things we have to remember is Jesus it doesn't die of a heart attack or he isn't hit by a chariot or something. He dies. He's publicly executed after a public trial by both the religious and the civil government. And so it's not some mystery why he dies. I mean, these people want to shut him up and silence him. And it's because... He's challenging their status quo. He's telling them, both the religious authorities and the secular authorities, that their way of doing things is not adequate to God and God's vision of the world. And they don't want to hear this. Nobody wants to hear it. I mean, it's hard. And therefore, um, you know, that is exactly it. You know, there are 32 times Jesus mentions wealth in the New Testament and prohibitions against wealth and the problem of wealth and you know, so look, we live in the wealthiest. Even you know, like I, I okay, I get my salary goes to the Dominicans and all that. But you know, look, I live a very, I live better than the wealthiest person in the world would have a hundred years ago. I mean, my education, my health care, the the air conditioner I have on now, the fact that I have a car, the fact that my life expectancies. 40 years more than people would have been, even than any one of my, you know, what generation would have had 100 years ago. I mean, we live, we're profoundly, just by virtue of being born into this remarkable society, we live, have an opportunity, we live a wealthier, richer existence than anyone else in history has known. And yet the poor are living more or less, I mean, if you walked along the Gaza Strip today, you discover that it probably doesn't look much different than it did when Jesus lived there. I mean, the poor are still living pretty much how the poor lived. Uh, in, know, in United and, States. But in the, the United rich States. become exponentially richer. In the United States, uh, every major city now has uh, a remarkable homeless population. So it's, we, don't, we don't always have to go to Gaza to see poverty uh, in its m most direct and dire example. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I work here very closely with the Catholic Worker House, which works with the chronically homeless. And, you know, they've criminalized homelessness now here and criminalized poverty. And, you know, they've been trying to close and move this house out. They've are, you know, and it, it is true. I feel sorry sometimes to the residents of the neighborhood we're in because it is true they kind of got a bad deal that we – but on the other hand, nobody's offering an alternative, certainly our city government isn't, to how to handle this chronically homeless population and what to do for them so that they – you want them out of your parks and out of our, you know, um, you know out of sight, but yet – you know, it's like the the capacity to do that requires that you take seriously the needs they have and not just dismiss them uh, as irrelevant or not even worthy of that they're just problems that you're going to push on. You're going to try – you're criminalizing them to try to get them to move on to the next city. That's what it really means. But nobody – but so so that they're not your problem. But, you know, this is really the challenge, as you say. You're right. We don't have to go to Gaza to see profoundly poor people. I mean, especially, you know, you and I, we live in the Southwest. I mean, you know, we live in a world that's been largely overlooked um, in the rural areas and in our inner cities uh, over the last the, – all the, the growth that's happened in our region. The poor are still pretty poor. You know, and the, the the living conditions are still not so great, and the and the health, the education system is still vastly different for the poor than it is for the wealthy, and the and the and the medical and health care availability is that yeah maybe there's a little more health care available when you're really really sick, but the average kind of care that keeps you and I healthy throughout our lives is still not really readily available to 
to the poor. So you have so right, many. It's not like I'm just talking about the third world. Yeah. We have so many uh, really deep, uh, profound points. Um, our time is running out, and I regret it. But the good and hopeful part is that Father John Markey will be presenting gifts for the church at uh, the UNM Continuing Education Building on July 26th from 1 to 3 p.m. Uh, this is put on by the Dominican Ecclesial Institute, and if you would like to go, you should RSVP, and you can do that by emailing uh, contact at deiabq.org, contact at deiabq.org, July 26th, be there or be square. This is going to be uh, mind-blowing, as they said in the 60s. Um, the last thing uh, that we have time for, and I do want to uh, make sure I ask you this, how can our listeners get a copy of your book, Moses and Pharaoh's House, either to prepare for your presentation on July 26th, or if they have to miss it, at least they'll be able to read these ideas? Oh, well, thank you. Well, it's um, it's through Anselm Academic Press, Anselm Academic, so they can always just go on the Anselm website, and that's a division of St. Mary's Press. It's a big Catholic press. Or they can go on, of course, the Amazon, which is taking over the world, uh, does have a copy of the book, and um, they'll probably... Um, and so I know it's on Amazon as well, and so they can get it there. And hopefully uh, local Catholic bookstores will stock it. I, I understand it as well, so. I understand that there may be some books, uh, uh, copies of the book available at this presentation on July 26th through DEI. But uh, I can't thank you enough for a wonderful, insightful, and uh, thought-provoking conversation today. Look for more on July 26th uh, with the DEI presentation. Many thanks. Dominican Th Father oh. John Markey. Well, thank you, Mary. It's great to visit with you. All right. And we'll look forward to seeing everyone. Bravo. And thank you okay. for listening to Archbishop's Hour Catholic Radio. For the past 60 minutes, you've been listening to the Archbishop's Hour from the Catholic Center in Albuquerque. Join us Monday through Friday, noon to one, for the Archbishop's Hour, discussing with our guests and audience issues of importance to New Mexico Catholics and all the people of God. Thank you for listening and supporting Catholic Radio.